questioning the means by which of art, uh, by the means by which art, architecture, and design in all forms and guises continues to be the most salient and perhaps most complex engaging force with which to observe one's own intellectual topology inasmuch as those sometimes perilous connectivities that transport us into and out of multiple worlds beyond the skin. Yet I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that one week ago today, at almost this exact same time, more than 250 individuals lost their lives and hundreds more were injured when a series of bombs unleashed and continue to unfurl the marked signs of disregard, xenophobia, and hatred that have turned all lives, human and non-human, across the planet regardless of nation, toward an unspeakable loss that is continually witnessed, embodied, and eschewed. Time, like that of a clock and bell tower I know very well in Colombo, stands still. Yet this same depraved violence is not new, and nor is it ahistorical. The legacy of colonial and imperial campaigns across the oceans and continents resounds today with blood lost, lives emptied, entire geographies upended to exploit, to mark, to extract, to confine, to occlude. All make us question where we are now and where we are going. So I'd like to begin this morning with a brief story about returns. During an evening thunderstorm in Rome on May 27th, 2002, lightning struck a fourth century stella from the city of Aksum, Ethiopia. Located at the eastern end of the Circus Maximus, the upper portion of the massive stella was severely damaged in the storm. Since its installation, the monument had generated controversy, questions regarding its preservation, how and when to dismantle and return it to Aksum, and who should pay for its relocation, ultimately guaranteed the monument to remain in Rome. Newspaper columnists and government officials agreed that having been a landmark in the city for such a long period, the obelisk should remain in the city as a historical marker. To remove the monument, in effect, was ahistorical. The conservation and dismantling of the uh, obelisk, however, began in earnest November 20, in 2003, when the Italian government agreed to pay for the Stella's return. Cut into three equal sections, the top section was removed, placed on a flatbed truck, and transported to a warehouse near the international airport. Subsequent portions of the Stella were also cleaned, removed from the site, and placed in a warehouse. And there these pieces remained for more than a year. So erected following the Italian conquest of Ethiopia in 1937 and placed directly in front of a newly inaugurated fascist Ministry of Italian Colonies building, the Stella signaled the culmination of Italy's and perhaps Europe's imperial fantasies. In 1947, a peace agreement reached between Ethiopia and Italy called for the repatriation of the obelisk. However, it was not until the late 1990s that preservationists and government members gave actual consideration to the Stella's removal. Thus, the only option was to fly the pieces of the Stella individually each weighing more than 60 tons, to a small landing strip at Axum. Only one plane was capable to carry such a colossal load. Adding to the complexity, because of Axum's elevation, the plane could only land when the outside temperature was below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Conservationists feared the flight itself might damage the pieces, owing to the plane having to flow, fly at low altitude and the difficulties of maintaining a consistent interior temperature in the aircraft's cargo hold. To land at night was impossible because the airport did not have any navigation system or radar for pilots. 
the Russian plane, it seems, had to land exactly at dawn. That the obelisk of Aksum is now very much a part of the safeguarded World uh, Heritage Plateau on which other stele like it are presented, no doubt signifies the potential for works of artistic achievement and patronage, of monuments, of quotidian markers and tools to be rightfully transmitted to those communities, royalties, former and extant, so that they too can be redrawn in the names of knowledge production. I would thus like to present in some way today a merger of four temporalities through and by which to recognize what Benedict Savoy and Felwin Saar write in their pivotal November 2018 report entitled The Restitution of African Cultural Heritage Toward a New Relational Ethics. They describe this as an interrupted memory. That is, how do we articulate the manifold structures of absence that delimit the forms and continuities of reconciliation, that found within cultural wealth are also the inseparable links to that of resource and natural wealth. Loss and absence across these territories are as much conditioned by time as they are spatially reenacted and perceived. Time's definition, however, unlike artistic production, can also be punitive. If, as suggested by the emplacement of the Axum obelisk, either in Rome or in Axum, is one mechanism that allows for time stopping, then so too one must interrogate how museal immobilities, as such a narcissist's choreography, are embedded within overlapping systems of political and economic movements. With the Benin expedition of 1897, for instance, from which thousands of works of art were taken and soon after dispersed across museum and private collections in Europe and the United States, violence stopped time. And I might mention here that a number of the figures from this same expedition are at the center of Emmanuel Macron and the report's proposed return to principalities in Benin. Such actions, which happened prior to and following such travails, transform the ways in which the African continent, in particular, came to be known. Described, sorry, described and imagined by the other. In this case, colonial and today's neoliberal regimes. Pejorative terms such as, quote, empty or dark, or more recently, frozen and secret, became signifiers for trauma, old and new. Such temporal constructions subtended the acts of pilfering, the aggressive renaming of that which had been lost, and still pointed to a spectral accounting of those objects, artworks, and narratives that may have inscribed a future history, incited multiple becomings, and expanded foundational identities. A number of individuals asked yesterday, how do we learn, and for whom? From 1945 onward, the question of returns within circles of art and museums was one in part due to the colonial or wartime formation of a dense juridical and spatial language that established the movement, and as Stuart mentioned, the circulation and meaning of borders, of those boundaries that attempt to conceal as much as confide meaning. By the 1960s, if the logic of independence did not induce a reckoning of or for return of bodies, of human remains, of artworks, then is independence ever possible? What are the protocols of repair? So I would like to prompt my two compatriots this morning on the stage and those of you in the audience to ask, what does it mean to return? Is return even possible? Rather than imagining it as a turning back or away, might we consider return as forging a catalytic advance? How do we, in the face of an imminent 
yet seemingly inescapable slow violence excavated within economies and language, within our environments, within the institution, begin to unbuild the violence that continues to lay waste to our shared and entangled histories. Thank you.